Okay, so thank you all of you for joining us today at this workshop, Digital Platform in the Global South, Shaping a Critical Approach. Uh, on behalf of the three of us, uh, Tristan Matlar, Philippe Bouquillon, and myself, I would like to say that it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you today. Uh, thanks to our institution uh, for their support to organize this workshop, the LabEx ICA, the LabZIC, the CARISM, and the Laboratoire Passage. And of course, thanks to all our colleagues who have accepted our invitation to participate to this today workshop. We're delighted to see so many familiar faces together here. We know some of you for a long time. We've already been collaborating with most of you as part of previous workshop, colloquium, publication, and we're very eager to exchange more today on this object of study, digital platform, that has been important in our respective research and around which we aim at developing a collective reflection. Despite the abundant literature produced over the past decade on digital platform, numerous gray areas and imbalances exist and need to be addressed. And I will let uh, Tristan in his presentation to come back more precisely on the literature review in a few minutes. An ambition of uh, this workshop is more than to share ongoing works. It's also to create a critical research network on digital platform and federate researchers working on platform and cultural industry in the global south. While preparing this workshop together, we could see strong connection between our works on digital platform and wanted to identify further and more concretely the links between our theoretical and methodological tools to build this critical approach in view of future project. So we would like now to present into more details several goals of those two days workshop and come back on some essential aspects surrounding the notion of platform and of Global South. And one of the central objectives of this workshop is to avoid locking these two notions in essentialist approaches. This objective is all the more important as many approaches aim to precisely define the platformization and the characteristics of the platforms. In this regard, research in management sciences and economics is emblematic and reach great success in academic circles, uh, but also among uh, economic decision makers and political leaders. In this research, platforms are approached from the theories of two-sided markets or multi-sided markets. In this perspective, uh, especially that of uh, uh, multi-sided markets, platform connect affiliated users who are both suppliers and consumers. The contribution of uh, multi-sided plat platforms, MSP, uh, is therefore to allow direct interaction between these users. Platform of this type make it possible to maximize the network effect. Maximizing, maximizing user satisfaction uh, depends, uh, according to this point of view, on the number of users and of their qualities. From this perspective, some of the theorists, including Aju and Wright, distinguish between real platform, and namely that uh, function as uh, MSP, and false platforms, uh, which they call resellers. According to this definition, for example, YouTube uh, is, uh, would be a platform, but not Netflix. These perspectives, of course, to uh, schematically summarize here, uh, have favored the affirmation of two series of representation. First, they do not focus on the balance of power between platform operators and affiliated users, since MSP, unlike uh, resellers, uh, would uh, only build neutral uh, intermediaries. A very enchanted vision of the platform is then promoted where platform uh, would be at the service of users and their interaction. They would therefore contribute to uh, the empowerment of users towards the industry. In the case of MSP, uh, remember that according to uh, Ajuan Wright, the direct interaction allowed by MSP mean uh, uh, that the two or more distinct sides retain control uh, over the key terms of the interaction as opposed to the intermediary taking control of uh, uh, these uh, terms. Second, according to this uh, conception, platform would be 
universal in, in scope. They are presented as being valid, regardless of the time and the society considered. From this pers perspective, the platform in the soft do not differ from the platform in the north. Likewise, cultural platforms uh, will then have no specificity. In contrast to these approaches, three dimensions uh, seem constitutive of critical approaches and uh, the activities of digital platform in the global south. Yet, uh, those three dimensions are not exhaustive and few uh, research uh, have articulated, articulated them. The first of those uh, critical dimensions explore the geographic, historical, cultural, or linguistic specificities of the territories uh, in which this platform operate. For instance, the grip of informality is firmer in the global south than in the global north. The second dimension of this critical approach consists in taking into account the specificities of content and service proposed by platforms. Thus, cultural platforms have specificities in the same way that cultural uh, industry have uh, specificities in relation to other uh, economic activities, as theory of cultural industry demonstrates. The last of uh, those critical dimensions links the research on digital platform to the logic of transnational capitalism and to the relation of power and domination uh, in which it is embedded. These macro perspectives are uh, articulated with meso and micro approaches, the later to target uh, individual trajectories. An approach of those dimensions from the global south is particularly relevant to apprehend the way platform revive older debates and question around the relation of inequalities and hegemonies. If here again, it's important to avoid an essentialist approach, the notion of global south bears real interest in the perspective of a critical approach, especially in the analysis of both long-term inequalities and power asymmetry at world scale, as well as local reconfiguration processes at the local scale. The place of social economic actor in the global south should not be also underestimated. In the case of SVOD platform in India that we've been more specifically study, we have observed the constitution of transnational oligopoly, which both strengthen the presence of foreign actor in the Indian digital and audiovisual economy, but also the position of a very small number of Indian actor on the Indian territory and abroad. These approaches seem essential to us in order to be able to contextualize and deconstruct the emergence, the spread, and even the institutionalization of the notions of platform and platformization in the global south. So, as you understood, this workshop aims at critically assessing the role of digital platforms in the global south. And as Christine stated, there has been a non-negligible um, literature, a body of literature on this issue in recent years, and we thought it was uh, important to try to map it for introducing this, uh, this workshop. And that's what I will try to do here without, of course, intending to be uh, exhaustive. So as this field is quite wide, I will focus my presentation more specifically on the research devoted to the role played by the main US-based platforms in the Global South, but excluding the case of uh, Netflix. So as Jose Van Dijk stated, the early years 2010, uh, marked the peak of a decade of platform euphoria. And, uh, uh, and this euphoria has permeated a large number of the works that were at that time produced on the subject of digital platforms and the global south. Of the global south. Digital platforms, for example, were described as tools of political democratization of, of authoritarian countries of the global south. Larry Diamond went as far as to state that uh, Facebook and Twitter constituted liberation technologies thanks to their ability 
to expand political, social, and economic freedom in the uh, global south, south. But digital platforms have also been described as tools enhancing economic development in the global south. A report of the World Bank states that thanks to the growth of mobile phones and social media in the global south, ICTs have great promise to reduce poverty, increase productivity, boost economic growth, and uh, so on, and uh, so on. These, uh, these two approaches are very different, but they are based on the same premise. The idea that technological platforms are just neutral technological instruments, yet platforms are not neutral technological instruments. They are socio-technical constructions, and they are, uh, as such, they are reflective of their creator's objectives and strategies. They are reflective of the context where they were elab elaborated. They are reflective of the specificities of their business models. And also, very important, these platforms are embedded in power relations operating at various scales. And of course, they are also used in very specific local environments. And all these elements that are excluded in the uh, previous approaches, perspectives quoted, uh, have to be taken into account if we want to understand the role digital platforms uh, play in the countries of the global south. These two uh, perspectives have also another common weakness. They are presented as being brand new analysis on the brand new role played by digital platforms in, uh, in the, the con contemporary times. Yet they echo quite old, old and very uh, well-known arguments. Larry Diamond, for example, um, reminds us of uh, what Michel de Solapoul in the 70s and 80s uh, told. Uh, he, he saw uh, new technologies as technologies of freedom. Uh, and uh, and uh, the same can be said uh, about the celebration of ICTs as instruments of economic development. Yeah. This echoes the arguments of the modernization theorists who from the late uh, 50s on uh, considered the media as key uh, tools for uh, national development. Interestingly, these two perspectives on platforms uh, of, as instruments of democratization or of development are today highly criticized by the critical political economy of communications. The critical political economy of communications, the same that already uh, a few years, uh, decades ago, already had played uh, a key role in debunking the modernization thesis and the thesis of ICL de uh, Solapo. One of the main figures of the political economy of uh, communications, having worked on the issues raised by the expansion of digital platforms in the global south, is Dal Yong Jin. He is famous for having coined the expression, the notion of platform imperialism. This notion is uh, directly um, derived from the notion of cultural imperialism uh, coined by Herbert Schiller in the mid uh, 70s. The notion of platform imperialism aims at describing the dominant role the main US-based platform play in the global south. And for this, Dal Yong Jin um, underlines the fact that a handful of American-based platforms are dominant in the global internet markets. And he shows how this global expansion of US platforms has been greatly supported by the US government in the name of human rights and national US interests. As you see, there's uh, a kind of updating of the good old doctrine of the free flow of information denounced by uh, Herbert uh, Schiller. And Dal Young Jin explains then that this expansion of the global US platforms has cultural, 
cultural consequences. Indeed, these technological platforms are not value neutral. They are carrying cultural values embedded in them. Their expansion uh, leads then, in the opinion of Jin, to the propagation at a global scale of a form of symbolic hegemony. However interesting they may be, the arguments of uh, Jin uh, are worth discussing at least for two points, in, in respect to two points, in relation to two points. First, Jin tends to have a top-down vision of the US-based platform global expansion. He does not pay sufficient attention to the role, the important role played by local actors. Second, the geography of uh, uh, platforms uh, that is sketched out by Jin is one where American uh, platforms dominate with, without much uh, competition. As he asserts, the major players are US-based platforms and they reign supreme in the platform market. But this is hotly debated, including within the field of the political economy of communication. Other authors uh, think that, on the contrary, you know, Chinese Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent now rival the US-based internet giants. Anyway, anyway um, the rise of US platforms in the global south has contributed to the reappearance of a series of important debates that had been left unresolved in the 70s within the framework of the new world information and communication order discussions. This is the case with the debates around the inequalities structuring the global market for digital cultural goods. And a report of Caribou Digital uh, is interesting in this uh, respect. It shows that the world economy of apps is dominated by two firms, Apple and Google, through their iOS or Android platforms. Moreover, it shows that the geography of app developers is heavily skewed towards the US app developers, who are the dominant producers, even if East Asian, especially Chinese app developers, play an increasing, uh, an increasing uh, global, global role. Similarly, similarly, concerns have been raised uh, on the detrimental impact that US-based platforms have on domestic cultural industries. In the, uh, in the global south. And another um, report of Caribou Digital is interesting in this uh, respect. It emphasizes some of the big issues raised by the key cultural intermediary role played by Facebook in emerging markets. Indeed, Facebook is accustoming its users in emerging markets to free content and uh, services. And by doing that, it is, it is depriving local publishers from, from potential revenue while generating its own revenues thanks to its data extraction and advertising activities. Another familiar debate uh, raised by the rise of US-based platforms is, uh, of course, the debate on cross-border data flows. As Anika Gurumurti has shown, current data regime favors the extraction of data for digital intelligence from the South by the corporations of the uh, global North. And this brings us to another stream of critical re research that has risen and which has resorted to the notions of colonialism or uh, coloniality for depicting the, uh, the digital platform's role in the global south. As Toussaint Notias noted, the increasing use of the notion of colonialism for characterizing the activities of these platforms, uh, including in the global south, has coincided with the launch of a series of programs aiming at connecting those who are still unconnected 
in the global south. We are thinking here of the Google's project, Project Loon, Google Station, but also uh, to, the pro to the project Facebook, uh, of Facebook Freebody. Um, this thesis uh, on data uh, colonialism, on digital colonialism, go much further uh, in the critique of the digital platforms than the platform imperialism thesis. Indeed, they suggest that there's a continuum between the contemporary activities of these, uh, these platforms and those of the colonial uh, powers some centuries ago. Ago. But of course, I will let you, uh, Ulysses and Nick, um, uh, introduce it, introducing the stream of critical research. So, while there, uh, there, these, all these researchers are very important for understanding the role of global digital platforms in the global south, but these, uh, these, uh, these approaches, macro level approaches, need also to be complemented by meso level analysis, studying the lived experiences of those who use the, the platforms for producing and circulating cultural contents. These platforms, and more specifically, social media platforms, have indeed offered, at a global scale, new spaces of expression and creation with a priori very low levels, uh, very low barriers to entry, and so much spaces that have been seized by amateurs and professionally professionalizing creators in each domestic market. Stuart Cunningham and David Craig go as far as to uh, state that these content creators have given rise to an emerging proto-industry in the cultural field. And this has led Cunningham and Craig to claim that these social media platforms cannot be considered as another instance of Western cultural imperialism. On the contrary, they, uh, in their opinion, social media platforms have had to be seen as facilitators of creator and content in the many international markets in which they operate. To sum up their ideas, they argue that these platforms are agents of cultural diversity. But of course, uh, their argument paints, tends to paint a too rosy uh, picture. Indeed, digital platforms are far from being only facilitators of content, con content creation. They are uh, also in each market where they, uh, have, they are operating, they are also contributing to the restructuring of content creation. They are contributing to that by the norms they, they prescribe, by the injunctions they formulate in line with the objectives of, the, of their business models. A handful of studies have tackled this issue. In the special issue they edited on the cultural industries and digital platforms in the global south, Christine Iturbide and Vasily Rivron have uh, noted that these platforms have contributed to a renewal of the forms of work in the cultural uh, fields. Um, they have in particular promoted the figure of the creator entrepreneur for better, of course, in their own interest, for better monetizing the contents they produce. And these platforms have also, for the same reason, submitted the amateur, artisanal, or informal forms of cultural creation to the pressure of the increasing mercantile relations. And this is confirmed by a handful of other studies carried out outside the Western world. Arturo Arriagada and Francisco Ibanez, in their research on Chilean content uh, creators in the field of fashion and lifestyle, highlight, for example, the intensified economic pressures exerted on these creators by Instagram. The creators they study uh, must indeed produce ever more content, ever more frequently for trying to satisfy the appetite of the algorithm. 
And this, as they note, reinforces such commercial aspects in creator activities. Finally, and it will be my last point, of course, uh, for understanding the issues raised by the expansion of digital platforms in the global south, it's also important to study their, uh, how their, their, their consumers use their services. The first studies dealing with the use of digital platforms in the global south were unwilling to take into consideration the fact that these platforms are socio-technical constructions. Uh, in his often quoted study of Facebook practices in Trinidad, Daniel Miller goes as far as to, to, to state that in this country, Facebook is only the aggregate of its regional and particular uh, usage. In this context, of course, the global expansion of Facebook cannot be something else than constituting the source of new forms of cultural diversity. Daniel Miller also highlights another positive contribution of Facebook for its users in Trinidad. He argues that Facebook users in Trinidad now manage to live within a considerable richer social world than a few years ago. And this argument has been influential uh, among the rare works that have been, that have researched the uses of US-based digital platforms in marginalized groups, social groups in the global south. Nimi Hangaswami and Peyal Arora, for example, have studied how the youth living in slum communities in Hyderabad and Chennai uh, use Facebook. And they show that this use, use, this use, use Facebook as a way of trying to expand their social network far beyond the limited social uh, capital. Through Facebook, these use, they say, try friending people from an elevated social status to fulfill aspirations of social mobility. However, this use of uh, Facebook as a means uh, for trying to expand one's uh, own social network, it's not without its limits. As Pe Peyal Aurora uh, states, by giving to young people who are living at the margins the means to travel the world, Facebook is also offering a pathway to envy and frustrated aspirations. The scant research that has been carried out uh, on the use of global digital platforms in sub-Saharan Africa uh, also highlight how these are used by the, their users, marginalized users, for improving their social condition. In the study of Facebook uses in an informal settlement in Nairobi, Susan Wish and her colleagues show that uh, their young respondents used Facebook for communicating with friends and family overseas, who are perceived as aiding more financial resources than local. They show also that Facebook is used uh, in more prosaic ways for looking for formal or informal employment jobs opportunities or for advancing their entrepreneurial efforts. All these findings are interesting because they underline a quite familiar uh, seeming contradiction between the ma macro level analysis discussed above, which study the detrimental impact uh, the detrimental role played by digital platforms in the global south and the way in which for many of its disadvantaged users in these countries, these platforms are used uh, as a resource for enlarging the social imaginary or even economic opportunities. However, this contradiction may be more apparent than real. Indeed, if these platforms are viewed as a resource by these users, it's also, at least in part, due to the strategies implement, implemented by these platforms for exploiting the potential of these untapped markets. This shows how, how much important it is to try 
to combine macro level, mezzo level, and micro level analysis. Thank you for your attention. Christine, it's to you. Yes. So thank you very much, Tristan. And, and what we said is that many of the, the different elements um, presented by, by Tristan could be indeed observed at several levels in the recent fieldwork uh, we carried uh, out with Philip in India, and that probably most of you have also been observing through your respective fieldwork. We wanted to conclude this introduction uh, by suggesting more specifically several tracks um, on which we have started to work, which seem to have been less study. Here so are some uh, a list of a few idea tracks for reflection to be further explored during those two days and that we wanted to share here with you. Um, first of all, while general consideration exists on the way in which US platform are deployed globally, few researches have been produced more specifically on the differentiated expansion strategies of those US platform the different strategies between them, but also in the different countries where they expand their activity. There is also little information uh, on the active role that local actors play in the expansion of this global platform and on the role of actors from the margins. More study need to be carried at meso and micro level, as Tristan was really emphasizing, to enable to better identify processes of appropriation alternative use, and even the serum convention of the logic of dependence. Further research would also be required on the financial presence of foreign players in national cultural industry and logic of oligopoly. Uh, more research is also on the international strategies of players other than the US ones, starting with the Chinese platform. Few element also on the way in which the hegemonic relation uh, generated by the platform are not only deployed in a perspective of north-south scale, but also between South country themselves and even within same region and same country. And finally, uh, too little information also on how the study of the platform in the global South allow criticism of platform in the North. So here, or a diversity of elements we aim at discussing with you during those two days of the workshop. It will be structured around three sessions uh, with one starting uh, just uh, after uh, our keynote speech uh, from Nick Coldry and Ulysses Mejias. The first session, uh, we'll detail it uh, just after. Uh, yeah, we'll start right now with the keynote speech and thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, being again here today with us.